All right, it's good to see you here tonight. We praise the Lord for a nice fall evening. We also praise the Lord uh, just for a good outcome today. I don't know all of us that woke up and just uh, trusted the Lord, and we just thank the Lord for His many blessings. Father, thank you for this day, and God, I just pray you be with our Bible study tonight. I just thank you for those who are just so faithful every Wednesday night. And God, I pray for all that's going on, the Lord, the Awana program and the youth program and a men's Bible study. And God, we just come here to learn more about you and try to just get even deeper uh, with you. So God, just bless this time that we have. And again, I thank you for the Thanksgiving season. And God, just thank you that uh, your spirit is here. And God, we thank you for your word and uh, how true the word is. So God, just uh, speak to us tonight. If there's just one thing you remind us of, Lord, uh, it'd be well worth the night. So God, we give you this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 21. Uh, John chapter 21. And tonight I want to talk to you about never forget. Never forget. And the outline is as follows. Number one, Jesus reminded them of his power. Jesus reminded them of his power. And folks, Jesus and God, uh, they, they are superior. They, they have power that no other uh, person has. Number two, Jesus reminded them of his provision. Jesus takes care of us. Jesus takes care of us. And number three, Jesus reminded them of his presence. I do not care where you're at. I don't, do not care uh, what time of day it is. I don't care about the situation. And it's not that I don't care. I'm saying Jesus is always with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And uh, that, that assurance alone I should encourage you this night. You know, uh, I think there's three, th or, or there's several things, excuse me, that we should never forget. Okay, I jotted down some things. And men, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you quite a bit, all right? You listen, men. Number one, the day you were saved. We should never forget the day we got saved. August 22nd, 1982 uh, was my salvation experience. Your spouse's birthday. Don't forget your wedding day. Don't forget your children's birthday. And here's a little change. Who you are. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget where you came from. Okay? Folks, we were lost. We were drowning in the sea of sin. And uh, God came and found us. And the last one, don't forget the many blessings from God. Folks, we are a blessed people. We are a blessed nation. And uh, I, I just look forward to the Thanksgiving season because, uh, folks, we have so much to be thankful for. All right, never forget John 21, verse 1. After these things, and again, so many things has happened uh, post-resurrection. Jesus just showed up in places. Uh, he could walk through walls, uh, you know, just all kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, you know, tells us, you know, that there were many, many witnesses, all right, of his presence after, uh, you know, uh, his resurrection. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee, and in this way, he showed himself. And, you know, if you go back and look at it, each one of them is a different situation where he showed himself. And then he gave a list. Simon Peter, he's talking about these are the ones he is showing himself to this day. Thomas, as called the twin. Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee. The sons of Zebedee, and we know that was James and John. And two other disciples of, two others of his disciples were together. Okay, so they're all these these ones are all together. And Simon Peter said to them, 
I'm going fishing. <laughs> okay? Now you think about that. And there's nothing wrong with fishing. All right? I like to fish. All right? Now, I will say I am a, uh, you have certain temperatures and certain things. I'm not going fishing when it's cold. I don't like to fish when it's windy. All right? I'm a fair weather fisherman. Is that the best way to put it? But I still fish. But you think about that. Uh, Post-resurrection, Jesus had showed himself, and Peter wants to go fishing. And some of the commentaries I've read uh, Monday and Tuesday uh, almost chided him for that. All right? Folks, if you have a habit and you like to do it, there's nothing wrong for him to go fishing. It's like me on Fridays. If it's nice out, I am going to be on my Harley, and I'm going to be riding my motorcycle and I'm out there with God, man, I'm praying, I'm looking at God's beautiful country, and there's something that's calming about that. So I see nothing wrong with them going fishing. Matter of fact, I jotted down some things I just thought of, you know, characteristics of fishermen. Now, these fishermen are the ones that do it for a living, okay? They're making money. Their their income comes from fishing, all right? Number one, they're hard workers, All right, if you're fishing and you're serious about it, you're using the nets, you know, they're hard workers. Number two, they're courageous. They go out lots of times in all kinds of weather, okay? Uh, I've seen fishermen, I've heard of fishermen that break ice to go fishing. Not going to happen with me, all right? But they got to put food on the table, all right? They had a lot of patience and... uh, I, I know crappie fishing I like. You sit there and you watch the cork, but I can't do that very long. I'm, I'm ADD, and I've got to get my bait. I, you know, i got a spinner bait, and I'm throwing all around while I watch my cork. All right? So, so they have much patience. They're not quitters. Why? Because that's their income. They work well with others. Okay? I mean, in this case, there were two boats, and there were at least two nets. Number, uh, in the next one, they had a lot of faith. And these are wonderful characteristics for fishermen. But when when you heard this list, wouldn't this be the same list for Christians? Shouldn't Christians work hard? Shouldn't we be courageous? Shouldn't we be patient? Shouldn't we be not, not quitters? Shouldn't we work well with others? So you see, because seven of the 12 uh, disciples that Jesus chose were fishermen, okay? Because there's always people asking, well, why did he choose fishermen? Because they had good qualities, and he was literally pouring his life into them. And they said to him, we are going with you also. That was the disciples. And they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing, all right? And I know, guys, I have went out. Uh, Art Childress used to take me fishing, and his dad was a commercial fisherman. And I'm telling you, we would leave. He says, he would tell me to be at his house at five o'clock in the morning. And the sun came up somewhere around six. So when we were unloading the boat, the sun was coming up. And it didn't matter if we were catching fish or not catching fish. About five o'clock in the afternoon, I'd say, All right, I need to go home. Okay, Friday's my day off. I, I, I need to go home and spend some time with my wife, all right? And what, it, what am I saying? I'm just telling you, he was hardcore. We caught a lot of fish together, but there were times we caught nothing. And that's what had been going on. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said in the then, now notice the word children, have you any food? All right? There's two ways you can take that. First, children, okay? Uh, you, know, you know, when you think of that, we are children of God. Okay? And I, I believe that's the way he meant it. But I think still in some ways, I don't think he was trying to slight them. But in some ways, uh, you know, just months earlier, Peter was the one that said, I'll never deny you. I'll fight for you. I'll die with you. But yet, around a fire, what happened? He denied Christ. So there was still some maturity. Children are not mature. So I don't think it was a gig at them as much as I believe Jesus was saying, and this is my opinion, you've still got a lesson to learn. Folks, we never arrive spiritually. We can never get to a place in our life 
We can never read enough of the Bible. We can never go to church enough to say, I've got it all down. Okay, we're all, we should all be learning. To the day I draw my last breath, I should be learning and and still open uh, to being taught. And they answered him, no. He, He said, do you have any food? No. If they'd been up all night, they're hungry. Okay? And with me, if I'm awake, I'm hungry. Okay? That's why I sleep. When I sleep, it's about the only time I'm not hungry. All right? And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And I'm wondering how many in their mind it clicked right away. Because what happened two years earlier, the very, the very, thing, the very same thing happened. But not yet. All right, we're going to find out that John was the one that said something first. It didn't click. They had to think about it. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Folks, I am telling you, even the waves listened to Jesus. Even the storms listened to Jesus. He had power over life. He had power over our Lazarus, raising him from the dead. Folks, when, when we learn that our God can do anything, okay, the Holy Spirit power is within us. When we invite Jesus to come into our lives, we get the person of the Holy Spirit. And folks, I am telling you, uh, that's, that's Jesus. Uh, you know, we put, have Jesus in our heart, but truly the Word should be the Holy Spirit in our heart. So what, what Jesus said, matter of fact, Jesus even said uh, in the Gospels, he said, greater works can you do. And you think about that. Now, how could we do greater works than Jesus? Number one, he only did it for three years. Okay, number two, they didn't have the things going on that we have. They didn't have the internet back then. You couldn't jump on a train. You couldn't communicate. You couldn't go overseas like that. And I'm not saying we are not greater than Jesus we, he's saying greater works. We can be more effective today because we reach a larger crowd. So it should not have surprised the disciples that Jesus, I mean, just said the word and there were multitudes of fish in the net. Look at John chapter 15. Just go back a few chapters. Go back a few chapters to John 15. I am the true vine. Verse 1, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Folks, there's times of pruning in our own lives. All right, it's not that he cuts us off, okay? You prune so that you can be more fruitful, okay? It says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. Folks, that is a key. If you mark in your Bible, you need to underline that. Abide in me. Folks, I am telling you, we will be uh, you know, uh, successful in our ministry if we will abide in Him. We have to stay hooked up to Him. We have to think about Jesus and talk about Jesus and read about Jesus and see where Jesus went, and see what Jesus did. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. For three years, the disciples abided in Jesus. Where he went, they went. What he ate, they ate. Where he ministered, they ministered. All right? And here's the verse, I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And I love this next part, for without me, you can do nothing. Folks, we need Jesus every day of our lives. Every morning when I get up, I need to talk to Jesus. When I have decisions to make in my life, I need to talk to Jesus. When I have a bad day at work or things going on, man, I need to talk about Jesus. That's what abiding is. It's not just being consciously aware of Jesus. 
It is talking to him. It is meditating on the word. It is spending time with Jesus. So I'm telling you, you know, when you look and you see what happened there, uh, uh, they fished all night long, probably eight hours, nothing happened. And within five minutes, they have a net full of fish. Why? Because Jesus is power. Folks, our God and Jesus can do anything. And the Greek word there is dunamis on the power. Okay, and that's where we get our word dynamite. Wouldn't you, don't you want to be a di- don't you want to be dynamite for the Lord? And not so that you can say, hey, everything we do is because of Jesus. Every th- good thing in your life is because of Jesus. So Jesus reminded them of, of his power. The second thing, Jesus reminded him of his provision. And look what it says there. And, and uh, therefore, that, that disciple whom Jesus loved, okay, John never identifies himself in the book of John. And we know that it was John because John was closest to Jesus. Said to Peter, it is the Lord. He noticed it first. Why? Who was the one sitting beside Jesus at the Lord's Supper? It was John. Who took care of Jesus' mother? It was John. So he was abiding. He was close to him. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, all right, took his shirt off, probably something like that, and plunged into the sea. Now notice the two different reactions. It just tells you who Peter is. Peter's always got to be doing something, okay? If something's going on, Peter's right in the middle of it. John recognized Jesus first, and then Peter said, you know, I think it is, and he just reacted. He just, man, he threw his shirt on and started swimming. Well, John and his brother James is in the boat, and there's, I mean, later on we'll see there's 153 fish there, so it's not like you're going to row in quickly, all right? So Peter reacted, which there's nothing wrong. It just tells you how different we are in Christ. John was more laid back. John probably was a deep thinker. And folks, God needs us all. We don't all need to be hyper, okay? We need folks that will be calm and they'll sit in the boat and they will make good decisions. Verse 8, but the other disciples came in the boat, the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net of fish with them. And then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it. Well, logically, a non-Christian would read this. Well, Jesus came early. Jesus went fishing before they did. And Jesus was preparing breakfast for them. Well, the only thing about that is, I don't think he did any of of the first two things I mentioned. Jesus can do anything. If he wants a fire there, he can put a fire there. If he wants to already have the fish halfway done, why? Why do you think he did that? Because he wanted to dine with them again. He wanted to have fellowship with them again. And what would he have had to do? Wait till they got there. Wait till they cleaned their fish. Wait till they start a fire. And Jesus was just saying, hey, I've already already started on breakfast. All right? And and, uh, uh, and laid fish on it and bread. And Jesus said in them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So he had enough, I think, to serve everybody. And man, he put some more fish on. And I believe with all my heart, uh, they sat around uh, as post-resurrection Jesus and just talked about life and talked about things. Because that's what he was doing. He was pouring his life into them. He was trying to get them to understand with God, nothing is impossible. But you got to have God. You got to have Jesus for this to happen. So, whatever Jesus needed, he had the provision. He could help people, but he never did miracles just to show off. All right? He was wanting to spend time uh, with his disciples. Mark chapter 6. You know the story here, but I do think it's worth looking at it for just a a minute here. Mark chapter 6. Multitudes were following Jesus. And verse 35, And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, 
This is a deserted place, and, the, uh, all, all, and already the hour is late, okay? He preached through breakfast. He preached through lunch. He pre- you, you, you know, hey, folks, my preaching ain't that long, <laughs> all right? All day he preached, and the night is long. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding countries and villages and buy themselves bread to eat, for they have no- bread, for they have nothing to eat. And folks, if they were in the midst, if they were in the country, it would have been a while just to travel. Okay, there's so many things there. They had to have money. We were talking, we're talking about thousands of people. We're not talking about, you know, trying to feed a hundred people. Okay, look at verse 37. And he answered them and said, you give them something to eat. All right. The disciples said, Jesus, you got to do something. And it's just kind of like Jesus said, well, wait a minute. I'm not the only guy here. You guys give them something to eat. And it says, and they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? All right. He didn't say anything about fish. If you gave them just part of bread, we could feed this many people. One is, did they have the money? Two is, two is where's the closest bakery from there? All right. And Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Did he have to ask that question? No, he knew exactly what, what they had. And he, when they found out, they said, we have five uh, loaves and two fishes. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups uh, on the green grass. And again, uh, you know, counting them and just seeing how many there, it really didn't matter how many were there. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. And when they had taken the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven. What was he telling everybody in that place? Hey, I'm Jesus, but I'm asking the Father for help. Folks, I still say, every time you bow your head in a restaurant, you are testifying to people around you. And it, it happens I mean, several times I've had people to come up to me and just say, hey, man, I am so glad you prayed. It's good seeing Christians praying. All right? Why? Because God gives the increase, folks. All right? And he says, and he looked up to heaven, blessed it, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples who sat before them. And the two fish he divided among them all, so they all ate and were filled. All right? I'm talking buffet here. All right? Full when you left there. And they took up 12 baskets of full fragments in the fish. And now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. And folks, they numbered crowds by men. And if it's a deal of four, okay, if it's a family of four, which probably with some of them did larger than that, because in those days they had quite a few children, They're, he fed probably somewhere around 20,000 people. And that's what he was trying to get them to say, man, I've already done this before. Y'all saw me, and you saw what was happening. It, it, you know, this isn't a problem. Whatever you need, I have, was what Jesus was saying to them. So never forget, Jesus reminded them of his power. Never forget, and Jesus reminded them of his provision. And I, the last thing, Jesus reminded them of his presence. Look at verse 11. And Simon Peter went up and drag the net to the land full of large fish. Now, I know how people that fish are. Not all of them are like this. But it's like, how big was that fish? Well, and I had a man tell me one time, ask him, how big was that fish? It was huge. I said, what do you call huge? He said, one eye was on one side of the boat, and the eye was on the other side of the boat. And I said, hey, no way, all right? And what I'm saying, people exaggerate about how big the fish are or how much one weighs. It's that part of us that wants to catch the biggest fish. Even Lori, when I first started dating her, she asked me the question, is everything a competition to you? I said, well, you know, if it's one of my friends, it's always a competition, all right? So... What I'm saying is these weren't little fishes. For them to write in the Word of God, large fish, these were 153 large fish. 
And it says, all and all and although uh, there were so many, the net was not broken. Remember what happened two years earlier? What happened to the nets? They were breaking. So folks, I'm just saying every you know, miracle that you see, everything in the Word of God, there's variances there to show that Jesus was in all kinds of situations. But yet, each one is different. A blind man, one time, he just he looked at the guy and said, hey, you're, you're going to be made whole again. He did. Another time, and that's the one I wanted to be, he spits on the ground, gets the, the mud up, puts it on his eyes, and goes, says, go wash that. All right, now again, if I heard Jesus and I knew it was Jesus, that's exactly what I would do. It's kind of like Jesus' mother when he did his first miracle, whatever Jesus says, you need to do. Boy, isn't that a good statement for us? Whatever Jesus tells you to do, you need to do. You can't go wrong by listening to Jesus. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? What does that tell you? Some of them still were just either shocked or just like, no, this can't be, okay? And it says, knowing that it was the Lord, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Notice how Jesus is still serving. Boy, that ought to tell us something, folks. Every chance we get to serve, okay? Because see, Jesus said, those who are greatest in the kingdom are those who are last and those who will serve. And folks, we as Christians, we need to do that in our own lives. Verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So he would just say one more time, hey, I'm going to spend some time with you. I'm going to dine with you. And we're just going to hang out before I go back to heaven. Folks, I am telling you, the more time you spend with Jesus, and the more time you uh, get in the Word and in prayer, the closer you will get to Him. 1 Corinthians 15. Go with me there. Just two more scriptures and we're done. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. This is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. For I delivered you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture, and that He was buried and he rose again the third day according to scriptures. What is Paul doing again? He's sharing the gospel. Folks, that's the gospel is what that is. And that he was seen by Cephas, which was Peter, and then the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. In Jesus' day, when it come to a witnesses in court, you had two eyewit- if you had two eyewitnesses, I'm telling you, it was, it, that was the law. If two eyewitnesses said, this is what happened, that's what happened. So what did Jesus do? Ah, we, we might multiply that just a little. He was seen by over 500 people. Folks, there is no doubt in my mind, Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus did what he came to do, and Jesus is living in me. Why? I've seen him. I've seen his work. I know him. I, 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 I know how he thinks. Okay, I know what he would do. That phrase alone should help every one of us in this building. All right, you want to do the right thing every time? What would Jesus do? Man, it's there for you. And then it says, over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep, which died, is what they're saying. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of, out of, out of due time. And of course, Paul, Saul, who later became Paul, saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he just saw him for a minute. Because, why? Because he blinded him. Okay? But yet you know, Saul, who, been, who was a persecutor, found Jesus, and he became one of the greatest missionaries, one of the greatest preachers, uh, one of the de- uh, greatest uh, church planners uh, we have seen ever. So we praise the Lord for that. Now, John 20, and I close, last one, John 20. I'm going to go back 
just a little before where we started in John 21. And we know that the disciples earlier had told them, you know, told Thomas, you know, hey, hey man, Thomas wasn't there. And we said, we saw Jesus. Thomas goes, yeah, come on. I, I, I'm not going to believe that. Why? Why did he get his word? Uh, why did he get his nickname that? What was his nickname? Doubting Thomas. Because there were 11 eyewitnesses, well, 10 uh, at that time, eyewitnesses of that. And yet he says, unless I see it, I don't believe it. And it, in verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came to the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. That's why I said earlier, walking through doors, folks, Jesus could do whatever he wanted to do. But notice the first thing he says, peace. Hey, guys, don't worry about it. I got this. I got this. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger in here and look at my hand and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. What did Thomas say? What was Jesus doing? He wasn't in the building at that time when when Thomas says, I don't believe it. He was quoting exactly what Thomas had said. Folks, he knows everything about you. He knows every situation you are in. He is, his presence is here for you. 24-7, 365. Verse 28, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Man, Jesus made a believer out of Thomas. Jesus never leaves us. Jesus never forsakes us. His presence is everywhere. And folks, we are going to be uh, spiritually attacked. I mean, spiritual warfare, I'm telling you, it happens every day of our lives. But we have to understand, greater is he that is in me than he is is in the world. We have to understand, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have to understand there is no power greater than the power of God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed me. You have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. You know what the world tells us? Seeing is believing. Do you know what God tells us? Believing is seeing. We have to have faith in God. We have to believe that God can change our circumstances. We have to be so in tune with God, when He is speaking to us, we hear Him loud and clear. Folks, never forget Jesus' power. Never forget Jesus' provision. The food you ate today, I know you bought it. I know you used your money, but God provided the job for you. The provision is from God, and his presence is always here. I have people that ask me all the time when I'm out in public or even preachers ask me, what are y'all doing at Rye Hill? Why is it growing like it is? Why are people coming to this place? And folks, the same thing is true. Jesus' presence is here. I'm not taking credit for it. Steve is not taking credit for any of this. And I understand he uses us. But folks, the difference is that dunamis, that power of the Holy Spirit, Bible singing, Bible teaching, Bible preaching, and putting Jesus and God number one in our lives. Father, thank you for the night, and God, there are some things we just don't need to forget. God, they're just too important to forget. And God, I pray that uh, our salvation will be one we never forget. God, I pray we never get over being saved. I don't care how long we've been saved. God, I thank God every day for saving me. And God, I pray that we would abide in you. God, we'd get close to you, that We'd make reading the Bible a priority in our lives and prayer a priority in our lives. And 
God, this world is so dysfunctional. It is so messed up. And God, sometimes, that's why I like the Wednesday night. Sometimes our Mondays and Tuesdays are awful. And we can come back in here on a Wednesday night and get recharged and get ready to go and finish out the week. And then come back on Sunday ready to hear from you. So God, just thank you for this lesson tonight. And God, I pray that we would never forget. God, we love you. We thank you. God, we just praise you for who you are and what you do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.